on episode 494 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Sadi Raza and discuss COVID health concerns besides COVID-19. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 494. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. This episode of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is sponsored by Haka Life Nutrition, the maker of GLX-3. I am really glad to have Haka Life Nutrition as a sponsor. Omega-3 is one of the few supplements I take regularly. But even with years of experience and having interviewed hundreds of experts in the health and fitness field, I have struggled to find a great solution until now. We all know farm-raised meat doesn't give us the right balance of omega-3 to omega-6. And that omega-3 helps reduce inflammation, which reduces joint pain and is heart healthy. Getting enough omega-3 isn't as straightforward as it should be. From the mercury in the fish to poor production controls, it's really hard to find a high-quality product that gives you what you're after. That is until GLX-3. Made from green-lipped mussels from New Zealand, this is the only natural source of ETA. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the full name. This version of omega-3 is particularly effective at reducing inflammation and therefore reducing joint pain. That's why my wife is taking it now. I take it for heart health. Go to hakalife.com forward slash 40 plus and use the discount code 40 plus to get a buy one, get one free deal on your first order, which gives you a two-month starter supply. GLX-3 is my go-to omega-3 supplement going forward. It can be yours too by going to hakalife.com forward slash 40 plus and be sure to use the discount code 40 plus for the BOGO deal. If you're part of the 40 plus fitness group on Facebook, then you've probably been seeing my note to self posts. Many of these posts are pieces of advice I've given a client or something that came up on a discovery call for my 12 week gas program. I decided to start jotting these golden nuggets down and sharing them. Interestingly enough, These short phrases are just as important for me as they are for you, which is why I call each of them a note to self. Here's one of my favorites. Note to self. How you spend your time and money shows your true priorities. If you sat down and looked at your credit card and checking account statements, what would that information tell you about your priorities? Is health and fitness even in there? Or is dining out, ordering in, drinks with friends, and maybe a fast food drive through here and there? I hear people tell me they can't afford to eat organic or hire a personal trainer to keep them accountable and on track. Is that you too? I know this money talk is uncomfortable, but it's really, really important. If you're seeing charges at Walgreens or CVS or your pharmacy of choice, you're on the track to finding out just how expensive it is to lose your health and fitness. Are you ready to prioritize your health and fitness? If so, You're going to have to invest some time, effort, and yes, some money to make it happen. And when you see the places your time, effort, and money are going now, you might find you have plenty of each to invest once you shift priorities. One of the advantages of having a coach is that you can get where you want to be much faster and often cheaper than had you gone it alone. If you believe in having guidance, accountability, and support, aka a real coach and not just a personal trainer, I'd like to hear from you. Email me, alan at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com. We'll get together and figure out if the 40 Plus Fitness 12-week gas program is for you. My email address is alan at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com. I look forward to seeing you in my inbox. Hey, Raz, how are you? Good. How are you today, Alan? I'm doing right. Still flipped out by that woman. <laughs> <laughs> it is a funny sound on that recording. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, when we go to do a recording on Zoom, they've now got this uh, this voice lady that comes in and says, you know, we're recording. And then she'll say again, that we're not recording. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just, it's kind of just 
startling because she's louder than we are, but it's just, you know, so you're going to probably hear us laugh about this for at least the next year. Yeah. Um, maybe they can give us different voices, maybe something a little bit calmer and smoother <laughs> to transition into these shows because yeah, it's like, don't Hello. yell. Uh, <laughs> but now everybody on the call, both of us, Rachel and myself mm-hmm. know that I'm recording and the little mm-hmm. red flashing dot was the indicator yeah. for that as well. Uh, but I, it is accessible. This is about accessibility. So I get it. I get it. I get it. But give me a calmer, gentler voice. <laughs> Everybody will be fine with it. You know, just something nice. Uh, maybe something like uh, Mr. Rogers' voice, you know, uh, versus the lady we have that sounds a lot more like uh, Mr. T. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> stern. Stern warning. <laughs> All right. Well, that's how you doing. Good, good. You know, we've been having some rainy weather up here in the spring, which is wonderful for my garden. But I've I've got a, a new client for um, who's running her first full marathon. And I told her to practice running in the rain. And uh, Mike and I just went out, we did a 10k in the rain the other weekend. And it really was a hoot. It's just fun. It's fun running and jumping in puddles. And I feel just like a kid again. And, and plus I'm testing all my gear because you just never know what the weather will bring on race day. So that's what I want my new client to experience just in case her race day is just, rainy as well. Just in case it rains. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So are you going to chafe? Is it going to hurt? You know, mm-hmm. how, how much is your clothes going to weigh when yeah. they're wet? Yeah. All of those things can be big, big deals. It's huge. If you yep. weren't planning on carrying an extra pound or two of water. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's important to make all those decisions and be prepared. Plus you've got the mental preparedness as well. If it's going to rain, it won't be a big deal because you've been through it already. So it's an advantage. And if it happens to be a warm day, you've got a natural mm-hmm. cooling effort that's yes. affecting there. So it's actually not the direct <laughs> sunlight dehydration thing. It's mm-hmm. a, you know, it's, 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 it's rain. It could be a good day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it rained during my first marathon when I ran the Blue Angels. Really? It did. It oh. was so funny. We, we came up to this hill. It wasn't raining when we started. And mm-hmm. then we came up to the hill. There's only one really hill in the whole marathon. Uh-huh. So we turn this corner and it's raining. It starts raining as soon as we get to this hill. And we're running up this hill and the wind is blowing in our face. Oh, gosh. As we're running up the hill in the rain. <laughs> You have to laugh at that yeah, point. Well, that's the whole point. The guys I was running with, it's like, I knew I was with the right group of guys. I ran into these guys at just uh-huh. at the start and we're running and, you know, it, it, I knew I was with the right guys because we were just, you know, it says, does it get any worse than this? And I'm like, I'm like, shut up. You don't yeah, know, don't man. say don't. that. <laughs> don't say that out loud. Yeah, because yeah. in Florida, you could have a thunderstorm pretty quickly. So. Yeah, anything could happen. So it was <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, let's just Aww. let's just not tempt fate. Let's just yeah. run our race. But mm-hmm. uh, they were fun. They were Good. fun for the first 10 to 15. 12 miles and then mm-hmm. we dropped down below seven minute miles and i was like nope that's uh-huh. not that was not the race i trained for that was not where yeah. i wanted to be and so i dropped down uh to closer to my pace which was closer to seven and a half to seven mm-hmm. forty five. and so sure. anyway yeah they 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 and they left their buddy that was the, kind of the first thing that got me was we were all military guys and they just they ran mm. off and their buddy fell out first. I was like, Aww. you guys are just going to leave him. I'm like, yeah, I guess they are. And then I, <laughs> there was just a point where I realized, okay, I don't, you know, I don't have any skin in this game. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to win a race. I'm trying to finish one. So right. I, I dropped out, but yeah, it's, it's good to, it's good to know those different conditions when you're doing mm-hmm. things. Absolutely. So how are things with you down there in Panama? Uh, they're getting busy. They're getting really busy. Uh, you know, Tammy's trying to do some soft openings on Lula's bed and breakfast. So mm-hmm. she's had uh, people come in and stay. Uh, most of them are staying for a month or longer. Uh, then she had a photographer come in that was going to stay for two days. Oh. Um, and she was scary. She's just, <laughs> she's just a scary person. Oh. Uh, I came in and I started opening up cause it was hot in the living room. So I started opening up windows and I'll turn on, you know, turn on lights. And she said, no, 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 no. Do you need to turn those <laughs> lights off and close those windows? And I'm like, okay, oh. closed everything up. And I went in my bedroom and I left oh, her alone. <laughs> oh. but, but no, it was, it was interesting. Cause while she was doing all this, I was trying to do a deep clean of the gym. We do that about mm. once every six months. We pull, literally pull everything out. Oh, wow. And the, the mats and everything. And we, we, we scrub the mats, scrub the floor. So we were about, I'd say, maybe three quarters of the way through when the water ran out. How does that there's no happen? Water, you know, and, and then we're in <laughs> Panama and, and I'm like, okay, I know there's tanks, but they're on city water and they're, they're a hostile. They should, we should have so much water. It shouldn't be a problem. But no, they weren't pumping water into their tank. And so we didn't have water on our whole block. And we didn't know 
just went out and they're like, we were like, what's wrong? They said, the pump's not working. Like, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So I guess guys were done early, goes go on home and I'll see you tomorrow at nine o'clock. We'll do what we can do. I show up at nine o'clock. I put the bucket, I turn the spigot. It works. I'm like, cool. They come in. The girl goes, that was helping one of the girls that was helping me goes over with a bucket, puts it in her spigot, turns it on. Nothing comes out. Oh, and I'm like, I got water out of there. Look, there's water in that blue bucket. I got water. So I know it's working when it was not working. They hadn't got the pump fixed and they didn't know when Mm -hmm. it was going to be fixed. So I sent my staff off to go find water uh, in buckets and bring it in because we had to have it to scrub the mats. And they found it down at the fire department and they were able to get enough water for us to finish. But just enough. I mean, literally wow. she went down with the bucket and came back and said, that's the last bucket. Cause they've now turned off the water to the whole area oh, so they can man. fix the pump. And, and so there's no more water. And I'm like, okay. And I went home and I told my wife, I'm like, yeah, we had to go to the fire department to get water. And we got the last of their water. And she's like, the fire department doesn't have any water. And I'm that's like, concerning. <laughs> that's not good. I'm like, damn it. I'm going to be that guy that <laughs> yeah. used all the water. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> no, we, we oh. literally took, we literally probably took, I would say 40 gallons from them. So yeah. it's not, we were, that was not put out a house fire amount of yeah. water that we were using to clean the gym. I mean, this, let's be Gosh. real, but yeah, we were able to scrub all the mats, get all of them back in, get all the equipment out and stuff, you know, dusted off, cleaned off and then put back in. So it was a tough, tough weekend, but, um, we were able to get it done and, you know, kind of one of those things. And I, I, I say this over and over to everybody on the, on the podcast is know, know your strengths, know your weaknesses, mm-hmm. you know, don't let your ego get in the way. The, the sure. first, the first two times when I owned this gym, I did the deep clean by myself. Mm-hmm hauled all those mats out, scrubbed them all out, put them all back and did it all by myself the first two times. The last Mm -hmm. time I did it, I hired three people to help me. And I was still exhausted at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And this time I hired four. So there was a little bit more standing around than I would have liked, you know, spending money uh, by the hour. You don't want a lot of standing around, but it was good to have the extra hands. So like when they had to go the block away and get water in buckets, I had the people to do it and it wasn't me doing it. Yeah, no kidding. I can't imagine the weight of all your machines and all your cardio equipment. And yeah, well, that's the other thing. When I bought the gym, I had there were 350 pounds of Olympic plates in this gym and one barbell, Mm. you know. And now, now I have uh, four, five barbells and a curl bar and about 1400 pounds of Olympic plates. So, wow. um, yeah, there's a lot more equipment in here now than it, when the, the two times I did it, but those horse mats are still those horse mats are still those horse mats and they're <laughs> heavy and there's mm-hmm. no real grip to them. So you use a ton of grip strength, picking those up, pulling them, flipping them over, um, and doing all that scrubbing. So wow. it's, it's still a tough day, uh, to, to do the work, even when I'm only doing a fraction of it, but, um, mm-hmm. I knew my strengths. I knew my weaknesses and yeah. I wasn't about to get myself hurt. Um, no. and so good to yeah. have that extra help for sure. Yeah. So my workouts this weekend had a lot of grip strength, <laughs> 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 a lot of moving around and nice, uh, but we're good. So, good. all right. Well, uh, you ready to have a conversation with Dr. Raza? Yes. Our guest today is trained in invasive and advanced non-invasive cardiology from the University of Vermont with additional training at Harvard's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. His interests include general cardiology and cardiovascular consultations, preventative cardiology, stress testing, and the management of both acute and chronic cardiovascular issues on both an inpatient and outpatient basis. With no further ado, here is Dr. Sadi Raza. So Dr. Raza, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, you know, as we as we went into COVID, and I I have made a point uh, on the podcast of not talking about COVID a whole lot, and and I only say that because there's there's so much that's happened around COVID, so many conversations around COVID, and it's become so political. But one of the things that really concerned me as we went into lockdowns was the uh, the term I'll, I'll use the term. It's called unintended consequences that, you know, so many things are happening to us around what we're trying to, we're trying to avoid one thing, but we create additional problems for ourselves. Um, and it's just something that, you know, you had someone reach out to me so that you could be on the show. And, and I was like, 
absolutely. We we have to talk about these unintended consequences of COVID. So thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Oh, not at all. Thank you for having me. Now, you know, we went into the lockdowns and and kind of the worst part of this was some of my clients were doctors. And so I'm training a doctor and the doctor's like, well, we're closing down the clinic. And I'm thinking, well, kids aren't going to stop getting sick. <laughs> kids are still going to need, you know, their immunizations and they're still going to need their well care visits. And, you know, so our, our medical care doesn't stop just because we decide we're going to stay in our apartment or house. It doesn't stop because, you know, our office says, oh, well, you can work from home. Um, the things that get us sick, the things that are happening in our bodies that require medical attention are better addressed if we are a little bit more proactive than if we go in for emergency care. And that's, you know, that's the discussion. But what we've noticed, and you brought to my attention actual statistics from the CDC, is that while we had this huge problem with heart disease before, it's now actually become something worse. Can you talk a little bit about that? It has. So if you go back to last March and um, here in, in Dallas, Texas, the um, spring break is always that first or second week of March. And so the Thursday before spring break, um, I remember getting and my wife's a cardiologist as well. So both, both of us got an announcement on email and text that uh, school was going to close early and um, no school on Friday. And we'd go into spring break with the anticipation that school would not return after spring break. And at the same time, uh, locally in Dallas and statewide in Texas, we also went into lockdown. In our clinic, logistically, what that meant was that uh, for our um, nurses, our techs, our aides, they now had to Consider childcare issues. In addition, the uh, the hospital that we're in, where we have our clinic, uh, they initiated uh, sort of protocols for who can now come in, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I still remember on that Monday, March sixteenth, we started uh, to do telemedicine for the first time. We'd never done this as a cardiologist, uh, as a cardiology practice, because in cardiology you have to see the patient in front of you. You have to look, listen, examine, do EKGs, et cetera. But we started off on this and, and you know, April ran into May and, and slowly things, things improved, especially locally and here in Texas, whereby uh, they, they opened up uh, in May. But clearly what we noticed was a drop in the number of visits to the emergency room, to the hospital, and to our clinics and, uh, and patients who would otherwise come in for cardiovascular issues. That is both acute symptoms and chronic management of issues. And this basically persisted throughout, certainly the acute hospitalization and emergency room data stayed down throughout uh, 2020. And this data was not just, this is not just US-based data. This is uh, this was also manifested in Europe and in the UK, uh, whereby they have large, um, you know, uh, nationwide healthcare system. And so it's very easy to data mine this. You know, the NHS in England can easily look at hospitalizations for cardiovascular issues 2019 compared to 2020. And we don't get better at cardiovascular disease in one year. It doesn't work like that. We look at data uh, in chunks of decades at a time. In, in the clinic, there was a little bit of a uh, inflection whereby June, July was busier. Then it sort of tapered off again, as we initially had a surge in the fall, and then definitely the November, December, January surge. And then sure enough, it wasn't surprising when the CDC came out with their data last week that the deaths from uh, heart disease had gone up for the first time in two decades. Um, And this reflected the fact that what was happening wasn't that we had gotten better at at treating uh, cardiovascular disease. And, and so that's why the hospitalizations were down. That's why the rate of heart attacks was down. That's why clinic visits were down. It's that patients were not seeking medical attention. And so therefore their heart disease, both acute and chronic, were, being, um, were not being managed, not being looked after. And of course, the unintended consequences is downstream, you have cardiovascular events. And as we know, cardiovascular events, unfortunately, lead to death.
This episode of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is sponsored by Haka Life Nutrition, the maker of GLX-3. You know the benefit of omega-3, reduced inflammation, which helps with joint pain and heart health. And you know you're probably not getting enough from your diet. But then you read about the mercury in fish, or how the fish oil supplement you bought at Costco or Walmart might be oxidized and rancid. Not good. Then you look into a plant-based solution and find it isn't very bioavailable or creole oil, which is much more expensive and isn't really sustainable. GLX-3 is very different. It's from sustainably farmed, green-lipped mussels in New Zealand. The 17 omega-3s found in green-lipped mussels include ETA, which is not found in any fish oil. What is ETA? Not to bore you with the science, but it has been shown to be very effective at reducing inflammation and pain. Haka Life Nutrition has paired this oil with New Zealand olive oil, and vitamin E to make a very unique omega-3 supplement. I think it's brilliant. Mussels are at the bottom of the food chain and have a short lifespan, so they aren't as susceptible to mercury contamination. And they don't starve out other species when they're farmed in open water. Haka Life Nutrition is meticulous about their sourcing and encapsulation of GLX-3, Each bottle is traceable all the way back to the place, date, and time of harvesting to ensure you get the best quality omega-3 product on the market. They offer a full 90-day guarantee. Go to hakalife.com forward slash 40 plus and use the discount code 40 plus to get a buy one, get one free deal on your first order, which gives you a two-month starter supply. GLX-3 is my go-to omega-3 supplement going forward. It can be yours too by going to hakalife.com forward slash 40 plus and be sure to use the discount code 40 plus for the BOGO deal. So, you know, I think many of us have paid attention, at least enough attention to know that if, you know, we are going through certain symptoms, you know, uh, pain in the arm is one, dizziness, uh, tightness in the chest, some of those basic things that we're, you know, we start paying attention to once we're 40. Um, <laughs> we pay a lot more attention to it. Uh, but at this point in time, you're, you're, you're at home and there's this kind of this, uh, this tepid fear that, you know, okay, this is out there. This, this, the COVID is out there and we have to be concerned about being exposed. And so it's one of those things where it, it, it is uh, kind of a counterbalance to say, do I, do I book an appointment and go in? and take a risk or is this just indigestion and maybe I shouldn't have had that second slice of pizza I ordered from Domino's um, (laughs) or fourth. So, you know, as people are going through this, because, you know, I can't say this is the last time this is going to happen in our lifetime. You know, as they kind of talk about the different um, aspects of COVID and, and the different variants and things is, it's really hard for, it, for me to wrap my head around the fact that this might not just be a, a Spanish flu, if you will, uh, where we have a three-year period of time when everybody goes through this situation and then effectively it's passed and, and we're on. This might be a little bit more of a protracted thing. So uh, before we move on, because I, I do think this is important and I really think it's important as far as the four steps that you have for how we can move forward, move beyond this. But uh, can we just take one step back and kind of talk about for an individual and, you know, heart disease is the number one killer for men and women in the United States. Right. So as we're looking at that, and, and I know men and women actually have slightly different symptoms sometimes. Could you just take us back to that level of let's talk about the symptoms of what would a man experience? And and this is the, this is the time to make, this is the time to go into the emergency room, or this is the time to make an appointment with a cardiologist like yourself. And and what would a woman experience? that could be slightly different. So, so someone at least at this point thinking, I haven't yet been vaccinated, but I, so I'm, I'm putting off going to the doctor, putting off going to the emergency room. What, what, what should they be looking for? It's a great question that you, you brought up the, the, the pizza analogy, because you can rationalize your symptoms in many different ways, depending on what you yourself are going through at that point. So you're absolutely right. March of 2020, and I have patients tell me this, that they would have 
chest discomfort, et cetera. And they would say it was probably the food I ate, it's probably stress, not sleeping well, and so on and so forth. And, and, and later you find out that this is no, this is the first sign of cardiovascular issues. So let's go back to, like you said, to the very beginning. So for, for me and for most cardiologists, and, and we have to do a better job at, at uh, um, public information, disseminating this out to the public. If you have chest pain, chest pressure, if you have arm numbness, jaw pain, nausea, diaphoresis where you're sweating, shortness of breath with exertion, shortness of breath when you lay flat at night, palpitations, unexplained uh, episodes of passing out, or even sort of seizure-like activity, you should absolutely seek medical attention. And you should do it sooner rather than later before you start rationalizing. And then more subtle signs. So if you feel more sort of more tired, more fatigued at the end of the day, if if you feel that, you know, I used to be able to walk up and down this corridor at work, uh, or I used to be able to climb a flight of stairs, and now I, I, you know, I have to take a break in the middle. Don't rationalize it as I'm a year older. Uh, maybe I've gained the COVID-15 pounds and I'm a little heavier. It's 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 easier. It's very easy to rationalize. What you actually should do is go out, seek medical attention, and then make sure it's not anything we need to worry about. All the other things, let's rule it out first and then go, go with the, well, I'm just deconditioned. I just need to lose a little bit of weight. It's, it's stress and anxiety. Those things um, won't uh, markedly alter your mortality and morbidity the way heart disease potentially can. And remember, Early intervention is always better. The, whether this is whether it's cancer, whether it's heart disease, the earlier you find something, the more options we have, the better chance we have at preventing something worse. Yeah, and and I think you hit on something really important. There's the early intervention. You know, don't talk yourself out of talking to a doctor. Uh, the worst case is he tells you you're perfectly fine. Go home and leave me alone. And that would be a great case. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and we get that all the time. You know, we, we get patients who come in and they have chest discomfort. We, go, we, we do the evaluation. It's not the heart. And what we tell them is, look, I understand you had symptoms of X, Y, Z. What I can tell you is it's not the heart. What it could be, I don't know for sure, but let's take the next step at uh, going back to your primary care doctor, letting them know that you had a battery of cardiovascular tests. We don't think it's your heart. Let's go down the next thing down the line, whether it's GI, whether it's whatever, X, Y, Z. Well, anyone that tells me they went through the last 18 months without feeling some level of anxiety and maybe even moments where they just sat there and said, okay, I, I'm just beyond myself. Uh, they're not being realistic uh, because I think we all went through those, those moments where we're like, okay, I'm not right. This is not right. I don't feel good. Uh, and it may not be a huge health concern. But in the grand scheme of things, if you're feeling any of those symptoms, feeling any of that, it's worth having the conversation. And we've put the conversation off because of the lockdowns, because of COVID restrictions, and just the basic fear that's out there, which again, the fear leads to anxiety. Anxiety leads to not some dissimilar, but then also that's a confounder that could actually be causing some of the heart issues. So as we kind of look at this full circle, it doesn't surprise me to see the higher numbers post COVID, but for a long time, the numbers looked great because, well, no one was going to the doctor, uh, even the emergency room. And as a result, it's like, yeah, you know, flu deaths are down, cancer deaths are down, you know, all these things are down. And you're like, no, they're not down. They're just submerged into this environment. They are. And, and you have this backlog of, um, of access to care. So, for example, uh, telemedicine is wonderful, but it, you have to understand the limitations. So when primary care doctors or specialists like myself, we did tele, we're still relying on internet connection folks having to either hold up an iPad, a smartphone, you know, uh, the angles are off, the lighting is bad, you can't really see the patient. And there's a lot of value in actually looking at someone and talking to someone face-to-face -face versus uh, over the phone. And so what would happen is I can easily see whereby they speak to uh, a primary care doctor or a cardiologist and symptoms um, either get minimized, lost in translation. They say, well, we'll see you back in, in six months and six months pass down the line and 
um, either they miss the appointment or something else happens. And, and this data is, uh, has been tracked in, in the VA population and also in, in the UK where the NHS has this backlog now of I think about 5 million uh, uh, you know, well visits. Of, of folks who haven't gone for their annual physicals, annual screenings. And if you just do the numbers and add up all those patients with high blood pressure, diabetes, and so on and so forth, who haven't had a, a, a checkup, um, whether it's in person or the phone, it, it's not surprising that you see these numbers. Going back to the initial question that you had, what have the differences been between men and women with heart disease? That's a fascinating discussion that's been uh, discussed and, and actually researched ad nauseum, uh, the American College of Cardiology actually has a wonderful graphic on signs and symptoms of heart disease. Um, and I actually tweeted it out the other day. You can follow me at, at Saudi Raza MD. And what it is, is the signs and symptoms are similar, but women may have additional symptoms than men. So they may have the nausea, the diaphoresis, which is the sweating, the dizziness on top of the chest pain, pain and the pressure down the left arm, et cetera. Okay. Now you developed, or at least it, it, you presented to me, uh, kind of a four-step process that you feel, and I, I'll guess I'll I'll put my own title to it. it and, and this should not just be about heart care, but it, it, in this premise of our conversation, it definitely is. This is a post-COVID wellness plan, <laughs> uh, particularly for people over forty, because we're the ones most likely to be suffering from a cardiovascular disease and dying from cardiovascular disease. So can you talk about your four steps and why each is important? Sure. So I think um, step one, and I'll be careful in what I say here. I think step one is try and get vaccinated. So today, I think the administration is going to announce that they've had more than 300 million doses that have been given um, since the vaccines came out. The U.S. has three vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, which are the mRNA-based vaccine, and then there's Johnson Johnson, which is the one-shot adenovirus vector-based vaccine. Since March of 2020 to, to now, our ability to mask, hand wash, and uh, social distance hasn't improved, right? We're not better at wearing masks now than we were in March. We're not better at, at, at being socially distant from each other now. We're not washing our hands better. If anything, society's opened up than, than those lockdowns. And they really haven't been a this wealth of medications that have come down the pike. You know, there's been, uh, we had the plasma, uh, the convalescent plasma that patients got, but there was a randomized clinical trial which showed minimal uh, improvement with that. Yes, we have the infusions, but really it's not because of medications or non-pharmaceutical interventions that our COVID numbers have plummeted in the U.S., uh, both in the U.S. Um, uh, nationally, locally, at the at the local level, at the city level, and internationally. You look at uh, uh, countries like Israel. You look at the European Union, and and all of them, the curves start to markedly come down from when a robust vaccination program was enacted. So clearly, the vaccines work, and for the most part, they're safe. And I say the the most part because that's sort of a uh, I'm sort of just couching you know my words because uh, there'll be folks that say well in this case of the myocarditis you're forgetting about the Johnson Johnson the vaccine which was stopped uh, briefly because of uh, uh, clots in the brain etc I'm you know I'm so I'm not discounting those but um, out of 300 million people who've been vaccinated the vast majority have had uh, really no side effects apart from, you know, the normal immune response that we expect um, from any vaccine, whether it's the flu vaccine, in this case, the COVID vaccine. Uh, we know they prevent uh, moderate to severe illnesses, they prevent hospitalizations, and therefore they prevent deaths. So get vaccinated. And, and a, person, a person that's most likely to suffer from cardiovascular event is what we would call an at-risk person for COVID. Correct. Absolutely. And, and this is, again, borne out in our hospitals. If you look at uh, pick a hospital, any hospital in the U.S., pick a hospital, any hospital in the world, the folks who are now hospitalized with COVID are younger and primarily those who are unvaccinated, which is markedly different 
from the typical COVID admitted patient in the hospital that we had for the first 12 to 15, 15 months of this uh, pandemic. So step number one, get vaccinated. It's very easy to do now. There's a phone number that you can text with a zip code and you'll get a list of places that you can get vaccinated. It's now one of those things where you don't have to get in lines, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, lots of places have them now. You just walk in. A lot of them, you can pick which one you want. If, if that's your choice, if you want to go with Pfizer or Moderna or Johnson Johnson, they'll give you the date for the second one. You get a nice card to carry. So get vaccinated. Step two, got to re-engage with your physicians, whether it's your primary care physician, your OBGYN physician, your subspecialist, your endocrinologist, your cardiologist, your lung doctor. Re-engage with them. Get back to figuring out how far away from the baseline you are have an honest conversation with them about the signs and symptoms that you've had recently and give them an overview of your health over the past 15 months. What's happened? Have you gained weight? Um, have you lost weight? Are there stressors? Were you exposed to COVID? Were you admitted with COVID? Let them know. Um, give them a full comprehensive history of, of the last 12 months um, since they last saw you. Step three, get back to exercising. So if you look at data that we have from fitness trackers, the, uh, the number of steps that the average person normally walks uh, in a day um, that, that are tracked in you know, Apple Watches, Fitbits, et cetera, those fell dramatically between 2019 and 2020 because we naturally became more sedentary. When malls shut down, when you, don't, when you work from home, you don't have to park your car and you know, walk into an office, go up and down office corridors, up and down stairs, uh, go to the break room, you know, you, you don't have malls that you can go window shopping, et cetera, grocery stores, those steps go away and they're not replaced by walking at home. They're just not, you know, and, and so you have to get active again. I understand the hesitancy as far as going back to gyms, but you don't have to go back to a gym to become active again. There's great workout videos that you can do at home, but we got to get mobile again. We got to become less sedentary. We have to do that. And then set yourself targets. You know, did you gain weight during COVID? If so, let's start on a plan to start losing that weight. Did your diet get altered? You know, were you having more comfort foods? Understandable, obviously. You know, if you go back to March, I remember our kids were off school and, and we did a lot of baking, right? Cookies and brownies and cakes. And, and you can, you, those things were flying off the shelves because people were eating comfort food. So get back to eating healthier foods, veggies, et cetera. And then the last thing is make a plan um, to get to sort of take ownership of your own health care and set yourself health goals for the next three to five years. You know, what do I want to achieve? Where do I want to be? Um, whether it's a weight target, whether it's, well, I want to make sure that um, I have my, you know, get my colonoscopy done I make sure um, you know, there's a knee that's bothering me. I go see an orthopedic doctor. There's a hip that's bothering me. I go get my hip replaced, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's sort of what I would go towards um, as we come out of this pandemic, sort of reassess and realign our interests in taking care of our own body. Our body is our temple. You know, we got to take care of it. Um, it during, during the pandemic, the average American gained around 29 pounds. A lot of folks gained as much as 50 pounds. Uh, we say the COVID-15, but it was actually not 15. It's more in the lines of 20 to 30 pounds on average that people gained. And there's many reasons for that. Give yourself a pass, but try and assess the fact that you did gain weight. You may have developed unhealthy habits and try and work to correct those. But again, prevention is cure. Start engaging with your primary care doctors. Get an assessment for what your blood pressure is. Have you become diabetic? Are you now pre-diabetic? What's your cholesterol? Um, were there medications that you should have been on that you stopped taking because you just didn't go to see a doctor and so you didn't fill the prescriptions and so on and so forth? Yeah. So I, I kind of have three takeaways from that. You know, one, one being uh, what happened happened. <laughs> if you let yourself go and you put on some weight, uh, that's past. Let's, right, let's look, on. let's look forward. You know, let's look exactly. forward. That was an event. Let's move forward. The second is you're the CEO of your own health. 
So you've got to be proactive. You've got to step up and do the right things for yourself. And that means making the doctor's appointments. That means moving more. That means eating better. And so making those lifestyle choices that you should we should have been making all along, but now going forward is our opportunity to act. We can't act on the past, but be the CEO now, make the right decisions now. And the final one, and you didn't really get into this, but you did a little, but be patient. Um, there's a backlog in service. There's a backlog in what doctors are able to do. But if obviously, if you become a priority patient, you're going to move to the front of the line so, but you've got to be out there. You've got to get that communication with your doctor so that you're getting the care that you deserve. Uh, so get into the mix. And then, yes, it, there's just going to be a, an element of patience in that your appointment that you normally would have made next week is now maybe three weeks or four weeks from now. And just realizing, okay, there are people right now that are suffering and need the care now. And there's a prioritization of service. Have the patience to work through that and don't give up on it stick with it. I agree. And, and the other thing is, the other thing I like about the patients is you got to take a long-term view to your health. It is far, unfortunately, all of us know this, it is far easier to gain weight than it is to lose weight. And you have to have a plan in place that has to, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Set yourself, set yourself ambitious targets, but don't be disappointed if you don't meet them quickly. It's sort of a, uh, what I would say, Take it not even month to month, but maybe season by season and see where you are. You know, if you walk on a treadmill every day, uh, the goal is, uh, say you walk for a half hour. Uh, well, the goal is to walk further in 30 minutes um, two months from now than you did than you do currently. That means you've, you've quickened the pace. Uh, that means, uh, you know, you've improved your cardi cardiovascular conditioning and so on and so forth. And, 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 not a, and, and the weighing scale is not the end all be all. It's not, a, you know, um, it's, you can not lose weight, but reduce fat and build up muscle, uh, which is just as important. Um, it's about an overall level of health, but you're absolutely right. You have to be invested in it um, with yourself. I tell patients all the time, I could be the world's greatest cardiologist, but I can't help you if when you go home, the diabetes isn't well controlled. If you don't take the medications um, for blood pressure or for your thyroid or you know X Y Z that you're supposed to, or if you're going for surgery, um, say in your knee, then you don't follow the instructions of the uh, orthopedic surgeon properly, and you know these complications X Y Z. Uh, you got to be invested in your own health, and together it, it truly takes a village. And together we can help you feeling better. Because at the end of the day, the goal for everyone is we want you to live life to the fullest and spend as much time out of the hospital, away from doctor's offices, doing the things that you love with the people that you love. Awesome. So, Dr. Reza, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? I think find something that makes you happy. Find people that that you can be happy with and uh, find a way that you can achieve those two the best way that you can, whatever path it takes. It's, it's about the journey as well, not just the destination. Now, Dr. Reza, if someone wanted to learn more about you and what you're doing, where would you like for me to send them? Sure. So if you go to my Twitter page, uh, so uh, at Saudi Raza MD, uh, you, you'll find a link to my website, to our practice, and I tweet regularly about cardiovascular issues, health and wellness, sports and fitness. And you can follow along and try and make it patient-centric. It's not really geared towards physicians necessarily. It's more towards patients, you know, ways to, again, prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, some of it is topical. So for example, in, in the last week or so, you'll see a lot of posts uh, around a soccer player that had a cardiac arrest uh, last week. But for the most part, it's more general than topical. And, uh, and you know, you, I, I, I'm fortunate enough to be able to uh, do media from time to time. So look out for articles or, or radio shows, podcasts, et cetera. Uh, my wife is a cardiologist and I have just started a podcast of her own, The Heart Doctors. Look for that on Spotify, on, um, on, on Apple Podcasts and and uh, we'll try and put the word out on how, how to be heart healthy and live life to the fullest. 
Okay. You can go to 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash four nine four. And I'll be sure to have the links there. Dr. Raza, thank you so much for being a part of 40 plus fitness. Appreciate it. Thank you. Alan. Hey Raz, welcome back. Hey. Hey, Alan, what a wonderful interview with Dr. Raza. You know, it is, I was kind of wondering how the COVID shutdown had other implications than what we commonly talk about on the news. I mean, besides the COVID-15 or COVID-20, that might be the extra weight we've all gained. You know, there is a real concern about our um, overall health, but particularly cardiovascular health. That's a pretty scary uh, side effect. Yeah, I, I kind of knew a little bit of this was happening because a couple of my clients as we went into COVID are medical professionals. Mm -hmm. And so when they were going to telemedicine, I was thinking, well, how does, how does someone who was about to potentially start chemotherapy and radiation treatment, how, how do they telemedicine that, you know, you know, if, if a kid, if a kid needs their, their standard vaccinations. Now, granted, they're not running into other kids with mumps because they're not mm-hmm. seeing other kids with mumps, <laughs> True. but you know, so maybe some of that stuff isn't necessary, mm-hmm. but it just seemed to me, it's like, there's a lot of well care that just didn't happen. And so true. you can't go to your gyms. You can't, you know, a lot of people didn't feel uh, like training. It was just, if I can't go to my gym, if I can't get out and, you know, do the things I was doing, the sports I was playing, the things like that, that keep me engaged in doing this. I mean, you know, you'd give me a stat that a lot of that stab, Strava put out that mm-hmm. the, the people that were doing these virtual runs was kind of going up. Yes. But if, but if you were part of a run club and that was kind of the real thing that, that you know, got you showing up was that yep. accountability, like, or you belong to a gym or belong mm-hmm. to a CrossFit and things like, and those things were just gone. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, I need five people around me sweating harder than I am for me to get my butt in <laughs> gear. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's just, I, I could see where that investment wasn't happening. You know, the for investment sure. of time, the investment of effort and then in the investment of money, a lot of people were trying to buy home equipment, mm-hmm. but there was none to be found. Oh yeah. No, that probably sold out pretty quick, but you know, down with you where you are in Panama, you had a pretty strict shutdown. You weren't even allowed to get out and get moving. And I know a lot of countries that were like that as well. And here in the United States, we did have um, a little bit of freedom to be outside in in most of our country. But I think a lot of people were still afraid to go out. We we didn't know a lot about COVID. We just knew that we didn't want to get it and end up in the hospital. So so, you know, I think a lot of people did stay home and I think the level of stress went up and we had talked about in the past about how the parents that had to learn how to work at home that had never worked at home before, plus helped to homeschool their kids because school went virtual. I mean, geez, there's so many things that um, kept people from being able to go out and work out anymore. So there's, it's not really surprising that we have a COVID weight gain or any other health implications. Yeah. But the data is there, you know, the cardiovascular events and deaths from that is going up yes. uh, and it shouldn't. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm almost certain that we're going to see cancer, diabetes, uh, those types of things, you know, where the care just wasn't there. If you're not going yes. in and getting your dialysis, you know, if you're not, you know, going in the doctor and getting your blood pressure done and checking your meds, um, mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe not even getting them filled mm-hmm. because yeah. you didn't want to get out and go to the pharmacy because you just didn't want to be exposed. Well, that, and plus some doctors won't refill a prescription unless they see you in person. Yeah. So, well, they were doing telemedicine. I, they, they, they changed medical care a little bit, but there's just mm-hmm. so many things. It's like, okay, they can't, they can't get the labs to know. They can't right. do a blood pressure. And if you don't have the, the monitor yourself already, it's yeah. like, you don't know. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, cause you walk into the doctor, they stand you on a scale. They, you know, they <laughs> do your blood pressure and yep. that's, that's a part of the natural conversation yeah. with your doctor. Which kind of takes me to the next transition. Go to your doctor. Right. <laughs> you know, get your get your yeah. care, get your care team together. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned uh, before this podcast, you know we've got to start showing our priorities with the way we spend our money, the way we mm-hmm. spend our effort, and the way we spend our time. And it's easy to audit that. Just go and look at your bank statement, look at your uh, credit card statement. Where are you spending your your money? Mm-hmm. Look at a day's time and just say, okay, how much time did I spend 
watching Netflix versus exercising. And maybe you were doing both and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, double dip in there. You're on the treadmill or the elliptical and you're watching your Netflix show. That's cool. Yeah. That's totally cool. But <laughs> most of us aren't doing that. You know, they weren't mm -hmm. doing that. And so it's, they look at where you're spending your time, look at the effort you're putting in and look at where you're spending your money and answer that question. What are your true priorities here? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's time to shift that because if you're not taking care of your health, you're soon enough going to be taking care of illness. Yep. Yep. Dr. Raja, uh, Raza mentioned that too, um, yeah, suggesting that we of course re-engage with our specialists and, but also get back into exercising and resetting our eating habits. You know, it's, it's a multifaceted way of improving our health, but we do need to focus. We do need to focus on it. Yeah. I ran across a study this week, 35 chronic diseases can be traced to inactivity. Wow. Okay. And I'll, I'll make sure to put a link to that in yeah. the show notes, but and, and this is not, an, and this is not really a new study. I, I didn't realize this was out there. That's the first time I was seeing it. Hmm. The study was done in 2012, but yeah, they, they've, they've manually they've physically traced 35 different chronic diseases directly to lack of inact and lack of activity. So the best thing you can do for your health is move, move Get, <laughs> do human something. body, yeah. <laughs> anything. Well, the human body was built to move. I mean, our, our lymphatic system is how we get rid of toxins and waste in our body. And it doesn't have a pump system. The pump system for your lymphatic system is your muscles, your skeletal muscles. So if you're not moving, then you're basically letting gunk sit there and it's poison. Your body needs to get rid of it. And the only way it can do that is if you move and, and push that stuff through your system to get it out. And so mm -hmm. that's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We need movement. And then there's just so many other things that movement gets us. You know, if you get the endorphins because you're doing yeah. it enough, if you're, you know, the movement patterns and, and the other thing movement does is it kind of gets the, the juices going with blood and mm -hmm. flows and everything else to where maybe your knees hurt less because yeah. you're actually getting more nutrients and, and, fluids and liquids in the knee mm -hmm. so that it'll function better. Now, obviously, if you go do some exercise and the knee swells up, you've got to talk to somebody and have that taken care of. But sure. for a lot of us, the aches and pains that we're feeling is disuse. It is. And I've said to a lot of my friends in, in run clubs and elsewhere that if you rest, you rust. And it, you, it's essentially true. You just need to keep moving to keep those joints fluid, keep your balance, keep your flexibility. I mean, I'm not saying run marathons or do something crazy. Just take a walk, walk for a mile, walk for two miles and just a little bit of fresh air and some activity can do so much good for your health overall. Okay. Well, you're the one that admitted marathons are crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, no, you don't have to run marathons, but, you know, you can get so much benefit from just walking one, two or three miles. And if that feels good, do a little jogging and maybe and maybe uh, register for a local 5K. I've got a 5K coming up this weekend and proceeds go to the local cross country team. So, you know, you do a little good for others while you're doing good for yourself. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. Rachel, I, I guess I'll see you next week. Yep. Take care. You too. Thanks. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Vivian King and discuss her book, When the Word Suddenly Stopped, Finding My Voice Again After a Massive Stroke. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.